Okay, so I think I'll I'll start. Um, so I'm Nicole. I'm going to be talking about um, anemia and just a broad approach. I think it's something we're confronted with all the time. So um, it's good to have an idea of how to go about thinking about anemia. So um, what we'll talk about today um, is just a few definitions of the anemia. A little bit of what you expect on history, um, your examination, the things you would need from the lab, then an approach to anemia, and then I focused in a little bit more on the newborns and the infants, particularly important for us at Rahima, um, and then a very short slide on management, and there we go. So just to talk, go back to basics, back to the beginning, um, is to talk about the red blood cell. So the red blood cells develop in the bone marrow. They circulate in our system for about 120 days. When they mature, they don't have any nuclei. So they're just like this biconcave disc that's filled with your hemoglobin. Um, the membrane is quite flexible. So it allows the cell to travel through the vessels without any problem. And it can fold and twist around small little areas. Um, and then the hemoglobin, has four globin chains. So you've got normally two beta chains and two alpha chains. And at each chain, you've got a heme, which consists of iron. And that is what carries the oxygen to all of our tissues. And that's what makes a hemoglobin so important because without it, we'd have no oxygen supply. So in terms of anemia, it's basically a reduction in the amount of hemoglobin concentration and it's below sort of normal levels. So there's no set level. The normal level will differ for each person depending on your age and your sex. And it can also be affected by things like altitude. So very high altitude, you may have higher hemoglobin levels um, and things like hemoconcentration or hemodilution. So you'd see this in pregnancy, for example, where pregnant women have increased plasma volume. So that would make your hemoglobin levels look a little bit lower, but they're actually not as low as what the number is showing. Um, and hemoconcentration, so example, like if it's someone that's having diarrhea, um, is dehydrated, then it may look like your hemoglobin is much higher than it actually is. So just something to be aware of. In broad terms, um, I found literature that says adult females 12 to 16 is normal. Um, or adult males at HB or 14 to 18 is normal. Um, and the anemia would be less than 12 in a female, less than 13 in a male. Typically, the highest prevalence of anemia, they say, is in preschool children, um, and then your pregnant females, then from there, females, and last is our males. So anemia, it's very important to find the cause of it, because anemia is purely a manifestation of something else that's going on. So we need to find out what is that other thing. So there's a lot of ways to classify anemia to try and work out what could be the underlying disorder a lot in the literature of how they go about approaching it. So some of the ways is by morphology of the cell. So we can see in our picture, there's our red blood cell. The mean cell volume is basically the size of the cell. So we look at, are they small, are they normal sized, or are they big? And then our mean cell hemoglobin concentration, which is the amount of hemoglobin within the cell. And the hemoglobin is what gives the cell the color. So if the color is is faint or pale, then we'd call it a hypochromic cell. So it's a pale cell. Or if it's darker, um, much darker red, then it would be a higher amount of hemoglobin. So that's the one way. The other way is to look at our reticular sites. So that's the amount of um, sort of precursor or the immature red blood cell. And it's a sign they are normally released from the bone marrow. So if there's a lot of them, it means that our bone marrow is making more um, mature cells, so the bone marrow is functioning well. Sometimes you'll see not a lot of um, immature red blood cells, so there may be decreased production, so there could be something going wrong with the bone marrow. And then other ways of looking at it is just in terms of thinking of causes. So is there a decreased production of hemoglobin? Um, so there's some kind of bone marrow issue. Is the increased loss, so bleeding, or something is distracting the, the, hemo, the red blood cells, so like hemolysis. Okay, then on our history, so what someone may present with, and I've sort of tried to include adults and children here. 
So you may present with some fatigue, they may complain of palpitations, feeling dizzy, headaches, um, shortness of breath, and then particularly important for our kids is impaired concentration. The infants, they may be may complain of irritability, poor feeding or poor feeding tolerance, and then some children may have some developmental delay issues because of anemia. If you are now suspecting anemia, we need to delve into the history a little bit more. So is there history of any blood loss, um, recent trauma, is there signs of bleeding disorders, bruising, things like that, um, any GI bleeding, epistaxis, that sort of thing. And then your dietary history, is the person vegan, um, are they breastfeeding, is there um, history of pica, so is people that eat ice or crave stones. They even say they may crave paper. Um, that's all signs of pica. Then very important is bowel changes. So things like inflammatory bowel disease and celiac can cause absorption issues. So limiting iron absorption B12, which will then show as anemia. And um, drug history. So like NSAIDs and anticoagulants can cause bleeding, particularly for females, pregnancy and menstrual problems. Um, and then chronic illnesses, particularly in our setting, HIV and TB commonly present with anemia. Um, malaria history or travel history, that could be a sign of malaria. And then a family history. So any parents, brothers, sisters with anemia as well, or bleeding disorders, anyone that's had transfusions before, and any previous transfusions in the patient can also be a sign that something of underlying conditions. Oh, sorry, I just want to try and get my thing moving. There we go. Um, so examination, what you may see for anemia on vitals is just to increase heart rate, so tachycardia. Um, pallor, the obvious sign of anemia. And then clues that's of the underlying illness. So perhaps there's jaundice if there's some hemolysis. Look for edema, so that may be your malabsorption again. It could be a sign of heart failure. It could also be a sign of kidney and liver disease, which could be what's causing the anemia. Look for lymphadenopathy, your nails. I've got a, a picture there of the spoon-shaped nails, um, which is a sign of iron deficiency anemia. You've also got your angular colitis, um, which is the sort of dry, cracked edges of the lips of the corners of the lips, um, look for the skin, for bruises, signs that maybe there's a bleeding disorder. Um, cardiovascular, always look for your murmur, that can be a sign of a more severe anemia, or perhaps that there's a heart valve problem that's actually causing hemolysis leading to anemia. Um, and then look for signs of heart failure. Uh, abdominal, look for any signs of hepatomegaly, sclenomegaly, and then you must do PR and consider PV for possible causes of bleeding. Got uh, the CNA system, you may have peripheral neuropathy, which may be a sign of B12 or folate deficiency, which could be also causing your anemia. Um, and then last on the urinary system, a dipstick, also you could see bleeding there. So on our laboratory, where we want to start is we want to confirm the anemia. We suspect it, but we need to confirm. So you want to do a hemoglobin and you'll see that it's low. Then you want to define the morphology of your red blood cells. So what is the mean cell volume and your mean um, hemoglobin concentration? Also look at the other cells, particularly your platelets and white cell count. If you're seeing a pancytopenia, that could take you down a different road of possible etiology. So we need to check those things as well. And then very importantly is your reticular side count and the reticular side production index. That leads to our classification regarding the production of the bone marrow, how many reticular sites is it producing. Um, and then from there, you'll add extra investigations, depending what you find out. So let's go into the classification. So I've gone via um, the morphology of the cell, so the low mean cell volume. So these are our small cells. What you may, once you get this and you find that they're low, things you must think about is just your dietary history, particularly for kids is breastfeeding. They say after about six months, um, if they're only breastfeeding and not adding additional food, that they often become iron deficient because there's not a lot of iron in the breast milk. So that's something to ask about. Again, your bleeding history. You will want to add your iron studies, um, your reduction index, and then sometimes the 
the range of distribution width. So that's the size of all the red blood cells. It tells you how, how different they are in size, whether they're all the same size or there's lots of small and lots of big ones. So typically, if your iron is low, you're going to have an iron deficiency anemia. And this is our most common cause of anemia. And you can see our picture here on the side. Very pale cells. They don't have a lot of hemoglobin in them. Um, and, and so they... Um, we call them the hypochromic, so they're pale. And then thales, if your iron studies are normal, then we can consider thalassemia. So that's when you've got basically abnormal globin chains. So the hemoglobin is abnormal. Um, and particularly on your smear, you'll see here on the picture some target cells. And they also say your range of distribution widths will be quite similar with thalassemia, whereas iron deficiency might be a lot larger. And then you may get something called sideroblastic anemia, which is when the hemoglobin is abnormal because the heme can't be sort of attached to the globin chain. So it can't carry the oxygen well as well. Okay. Anemia of chronic disorders can present with a low mean cell volume. So it's something to consider, especially if your iron studies are showing a anemia of chronic disorders picture. So that would be a very high ferritin um, levels, but they still have this anemia. Typically, though, the anemia of chronic disorders will have a normal MCV, but it can be low. So just something to take note of. Then our high MCV. So these are our big red blood cells. Um, typically, the most common ones are the middle, so the oval-shaped cells. That's with our vitamin B12 and folate deficiency. Um, and you'll see that on the smear, you'll see something like the teardrop cell. And what happens to the neutrophils is you get so you're sort of extra lobules of the, the nucleus, so it's hypersegmented neutrophil. Um, and you would obviously confirm this with the serum B12 and folate levels, which be below. You'd want to find out about your dietary history, particularly people that are vegan would have issues here. Um, and then if the cells are not oval and they're more round in shape, then we need to consider all those things on the side. Um, so things like alcohol, liver disease, marrow that's infiltrated, certain drugs can do it. So particularly for us, that's important is the dovidine for our, all our patients that we're on that for HIV. Um, and then you can also see it in hypothyroidism um, and can have a large MCV for your sickle cells as well. And then your additional test to confirm those things would be on the side. So like a TSH for your hypothyroidism. Um, and if you're worried about the marrow, you would do a bone marrow. Okay. Then a normal MCV. So this is where things get a little bit more tricky. We don't have a nice algorithm from here, so we need to add some lab um, tests. So here, very important to do reticular side count and the RPI, so the index. If it's increased, it means that our bone marrow is responding and it's producing a lot more reticular sites. So something is causing our, our blood or the hemoglobin to be lost. So here, you want to then add tests for signs of hemolysis. So signs of hemolysis would be an increased LDH, a decreased haptoglobin, and an increased unconjugated bilirubin. So over here, so our normal MCV increased um, reticular side production, increased uh, index, sorry, with signs of hemolysis, there's all our causes. So the hereditary ones, um, would be things like hereditary spherocytosis, your G6PD deficiency, and your sickle cell disease. And then your acquired um, hemolytic things would be signs of things like infection, like malaria, your um, hemolytic disorders in the microvascular and macrovascular system, as well as an immune hemolysis. So you can have autoimmune hemolytic anemia and transfusion reactions. If there's no signs of hemolysis, the commonest cause for this picture would actually be hemorrhage. So look out for that. And I'll lay a test to confirm um, these specific hemolytic conditions would be like a Coombs test, your HB electrophoresis for thalassemias, uh, if you're suspecting infection, your CRP cultures, etc. Then a normal MCV with a decreased or normal RPI causes commonly is an acute blood loss. So this would typically be you've just lost the blood and your bone marrow hasn't yet started producing new blood cells. Common one, anemia of chronic disease, disease um, renal disease, especially chronic. Um, 
infections long standing, certain drugs can do it, and then bone marrow depression or infiltration. It can also be a mixed picture. So they talk about I, someone with an iron deficiency anemia might have very small cells, but then they also have a con common B12 deficiency. So they have big cells. So together it equals a normal MCB. So you must just be aware of those type of things. All right. Then I'm going to focus a little bit more on our newborn and infant approach. Um, so there's some interesting conditions in here. And like I said, we do see a lot of neonates in the ED. So for our little ones, um, the history, they may be fatigued. They may have a bit of shortness of breath. They'll show some tachycardia. They'll be pale. They may be jaundice. Um, and you may see some hepatospinomegaly. And for them, the literature that I found said, first, confirm your anemia with your low HP and then assess your reticular side count and your RPI. So if the RPI um, is high, then it's producing, it's trying to catch up. So often the cause is due to blood loss or destruction of the red blood cell. And if it's low, it's because the, they're not producing enough red blood cells. So anemia due to blood loss in the neonate. So here it becomes really important to ask about your perinatal history um, and history during birth. So a common cause is peripartum blood loss. So this can be things like an abrupt placenta that occurred before delivery. So the, the baby lost a lot of blood there and now that's why they're anemic. The other thing is the twin, oh, I actually wrote it down at the bottom, but it's a twin transfusion basically. So the two twins share the same placenta and one gets more blood flow than the other one. So you'll see twin B will have will be pale, will be anemic, and the other twin will actually be polycythemic. So it's important to find out the history. Did they have the same placenta? And if you could see it or if someone made a note about the placenta, they often talk about um, arteriovenous anastomosis between the two twins on the, on the placenta. The other cause is if mom has had a chronic bleed during the pregnancy, and it actually causes the baby's blood to flow back through the placenta into the mom. And here you can do this Cly Hauer Betke test, which is basically when you take a test on mom and you'll see the fetal blood cells in her blood. Um, so that would be anemia due to mom actually having consistent blood loss. And then the last one on this slide is iatrogenic anemia. So this would be our babies and maybe in hospital for a long time. And we're drawing blood from them every single day and we're making them anemic. All right. So anemia due to red blood, red blood cell destruction. So here we would see signs of hemolysis. So your increased unconjugated bilirubin, increased LDH, and decreased haptoglobin, and your baby would be jaundiced. Okay. Um, and then you would do a Coombs test on baby, and you would see that it's positive. And here's, I think, one we all know is our RH incompatibility. So mom is RH negative, but baby's RH positive. Um, and mom is basically attacking um, baby. Then our babies that would come back with Coombs negative, then you would need to perform a peripheral smear. And these are all our sort of genetic or hereditary conditions. I did mention some of them before, but here you, I just put some pictures as well. So at the top, we've got our sickle cell disease. So you see the nice sickles there, the spherocytes, very round red blood cells and um completely uniform the color. We don't have that nice biconcave central pallor um, as normal. And then you can get your G6 PD deficiencies. And these on the smear, you see like the bite cells at the bottom, literally a piece has been taken out of the red blood cell as the cells gone through the spleen. And they also talk about Heinz bodies there. Um, and these I say you'll typically see in your infants or your children between three and six months of age, they'll present early on with this type of picture. And then our anemias of um, red blood cell underproduction. So this is very similar to what we spoke about with the adults. So your low MCV again is your iron deficiency anemia. And they also talk about lead poisoning, especially for children, because they're always picking up things, putting it in your mouth, in their mouths, get a good history about um, possible exposures there. 
Then our macrocytic anemia, so the big MCV for children. Again, your B12 and folate, you would confirm by doing those tests. If those were fine, you then go across to the other side. And particularly for kids, you need to, or young children, you need to be aware of congenital hypothyroidism. So do a TSH and a T4 on them. They would present with uh, constipation and feeding problems and often have like little hernias and they're quite floppy children. So look for those signs for them. And then diamond black fan anemia is a hereditary condition. It's basically like an aplastic anemia um, and they can have sort of craniofacial abnormality, so a cleft lip, wide spaced eyes, and they talk about a triphalangeal thumb. So if you see those things, suspect that for them. Um, if they've got red, big red blood cells, those abnormalities, they could be having your black fan anemia, and you confirm it with high levels of ADA and your HGF levels. Okay. And ultimately confirm on bone marrow, sorry. Then your mean cell volume for neonates, if that comes back as normal sized, these are your typical conditions for them. So if they are full term, they're within eight to 12 weeks of life and the hemoglobin is between nine and 11, this could be actually a normal physiological anemia of infancy. So when we're born, we come from the womb, which is a low oxygen environment into the external world where there's lots of oxygen and that kind of acts as a negative feedback to our erythropoietin, which decreases production of hemoglobin for that short period. So we get this big dip in our HP and that is physiologic. If it's lower than nine, then you would worry, or if there's other signs like your jaundice or a large spleen, then you would worry. But otherwise, if it's meeting those criteria, it's probably actually a normal response. And you also get anemia of prematurity. So our prem babies, they the red blood cells are um, live for a shorter amount of time and they also their marrow is not as mature. So they don't produce as much hemoglobin and red blood cells. So they may have a more severe drop in anemia, so that's seven to nine, but they will respond and it'll pick up after, after some time. Um, if there are, like I said, signs of fever, splenomegaly, there's jaundice, look for other things. So infection, particularly think of our storch infection, so syphilis, toxo, rubella, those type of things, because that could be what's causing your anemia there. Um, and then they also talk about transient erythroblastic, oh, I can't see this picture, this thing is blocking me, of childhood. Um, but this is typically with six months of age, and it's kind of a benign condition. It eventually goes away after a little while, um, and your child will be fine. But they say it is a diagnosis of exclusion, so make sure you've excluded the other things, the infection, any genetic problems for the anemia, before you say that it's that. All right, and then your management for an anemic patient is always to stabilize your patient um, according to your ABCDE principles. Uh, make sure that they are stable, um, keep monitoring their vitals, and you may need to give them some IV fluids. And depending on how low your HB is, you may need to consider blood products. And if there is signs of an active bleed, you need to work out how to stop that bleed else. You know, HB is going to just keep dropping and then ultimately manage the course. So once you've gone through all the approaches and found out what it is, then manage that. So if it's an iron deficiency, give them iron supplementation. If it's a B12 deficiency, give them B12. Things like your thalassemias might need blood transfusions. So yeah, once you've got, gone through your approach, you manage your ultimate diagnosis. All right, and that's it. Thank you. I hope this was helpful um, just to get some idea of how to approach anemia. And those are my references. Thanks.